Good morning, Theology 4. This is uh, the lesson for Monday, April the 6th, and our question today is, is it ever permissible to lie? Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, well, um, welcome back from your spring break. I hope it was enjoyable. Um, we're going to try and uh, up our game a little bit as we come into our third week of online instruction. Um, so please be aware, uh, you want to look in the lesson plans, and uh, you should see there uh, an invite to a live session this Thursday uh, at uh, 8 a.m. So that'll be, uh, it's scheduled that way because um, I hate you. No, just kidding, not because I hate you. Uh, it's at 8 a.m. because that's when our, our class is normally scheduled uh, on campus. And so we're just gonna keep with that uh, schedule for all of our classes. Whenever we do a live session, it's gonna be scheduled for the last time that that class meets during that week. More on that to come. You'll hear about that a forum as well. So I won't belabor the point now. So our question today is, is it ever permissible to lie? We are, of course, entering uh, a discussion about the Eighth Commandment. And so we should begin just by stating what the Eighth Commandment says. The Eighth Commandment, you all know, says, You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Uh, so that's a, an interesting way to put it. Usually when we hear uh, the Eighth Commandment, we think, or when we, when we try and summon to mind what the Eighth Commandment is, we think to ourselves, that's the one against lying, right? Well, interestingly, it's phrased here as a legal term, right? To bear false witness against one's neighbor. So it's a legal term that means, uh, first, perjury, right? to testify uh, against, uh, against your neighbor falsely, or to uh, testify to the guilt of an innocent person, or to the innocence of a guilty person. All those would be included under the, this sense of uh, perjury, right? Bearing false witness against our neighbor. Um, and so you can see there that the idea of a lie is very clearly embedded into what it means to bear false witness, to perjure oneself. Well, what exactly do we mean by a lie? Because that's not just something that is done in a court of law. Um, a lie is something that we can do in many different uh, circumstances. So for our purposes, let's uh, go with the definition that St. Augustine uses and the one that the Catechism will repeat uh, in the paragraph 2482. A lie consists in speaking a falsehood with the intention of deceiving. Again, the Catechism will say in paragraph 2484 that to lie is to speak or act against the truth in order to lead someone into error. So a person who lies is going to speak or act in a way that, uh, that conveys something untrue with the intention and expectation that the other person the one I'm speaking to, or the one who is observing my actions, is going to believe that I'm representing the truth to them. So that creates uh, a disunity between what's in my mind and what is conveyed to somebody else. Um, and it prevents the other person from being able to know reality as I know it to be. And that can be more important or less important depending on the circumstances. Um, but what we want to see here is that um, there's a, a rupture between my word and the reality uh, of, of the world around us. And I'm conveying that with the specific intention of deceiving somebody. So that differs, of course, uh, in, most of the time. It differs from, uh, from a joke or something like that where, um, you know, I, as a, uh, as a, a point of humor, I might uh, say that things are one way when in fact 
uh, there another way because the other person is going to see, oh, that doesn't accord with reality at all. Ha ha, guffaw, chuckle. Um, so uh, let's, let's confine our thinking here to lies that are told uh, with the intent of deceiving the other person uh, so that they, they simply won't know what the landscape of reality looks like. Well, is it ever permissible to do that? Think for a second of a couple of instances in which you would want to tell a lie. And not just you would want to tell the lie, but it would seem like it, you'd be doing a good or at least a neutral thing. Take a second. Okay, so for sure you just hit the fast forward button, uh, but, but let's think about that. Now, the Catechism is going to tell us uh, in paragraph 2485 that by its very nature, lying is to be condemned. That means, so by its very nature, that, that phrase is interchangeable with the word intrinsic. So, uh, so a lie is an intrinsic evil. By its very nature, it is wrong. So that means, and this is really challenging, I think, that means that I should prefer to die than to knowingly speak an untruth with the intention of deceiving somebody. So the deliberate intention of leading a neighbor into error by saying things contrary to the truth constitutes a failure in justice and charity. So that's another part of uh, paragraph 2485. So it is by its very nature to be condemned, and it's a failure or, or a, an offense against justice and charity to do that to one's neighbor. Well, okay, I think I already know where some of us are going to go with this. You're going to say, okay, all right, Mr. Mo, so you're telling me that during World War II, if the Nazis showed up to my house and said, are there any Jews in the house? I would be wrong for saying, nope, no Jews in this house. Mm -mm. It would actually be the right thing to do for me to say, yep, they're right up that way. Go ahead. Okay. I'm not saying that. Admittedly, this is kind of a sticky area. Uh, so let's try and let's try and walk through that a little bit. First, let's take a look at what the Catechism says uh, in paragraphs 2488 to 2489. Um, this is a, this is an important, or sorry, 2488 to, oh, I think I mislabeled this here. I'll, I'll put the right, um, the, the right notation in the, uh, in the lesson plan notes. So this is what the catechism says. The right to the communication of truth is not unconditional. So let's stop there a second. What does that mean? That means that I don't have to tell every single person uh, who asks me a question, I don't have to answer every single question that's put to me. Are there Jews in the house? I don't have to answer that. That person does not have the right to that truth. Why? Because they intend to do evil with it. Okay, let's pause there and let's keep going. This requires us in concrete situations to judge whether or not it is appropriate to reveal the truth to someone who asks for it. Charity and respect for the truth should dictate the response to every request for information or communication. The good and safety of others, respect for privacy, and the common good are sufficient reasons for being silent about what ought not to be known or for making use of a discreet language. No one is bound to reveal the truth to someone who does not have the right to know it. All right, so a couple of things that I want to break down uh, in, in that. So first of all, you know, we want to go to the extreme examples and talk about, well, the Nazis are at the door and you've got some, some Jews in, in the attic that you're trying to keep safe. Okay. Um, well, this is actually more broadly applicable than just that. So think about, uh, when a good friend of yours conveys a, you know, they, they just tell you that, that, uh, that deep gut wrenching, uh, secret, Right. And then another friend of yours comes over and says, wow, I saw you having a conversation with with, you know, Tom there. Uh, what do he tell you? Well, am I obligated to now share that secret? No, of course not. Now, OK, we have to make an exception here. 
if it looks like uh, like Tom is going to hurt himself or somebody else, if this knowledge is not shared, then of course uh, that means that that's a, a secret that I'm actually bound not to keep. And in point of fact, uh, the Catechism makes this point as well that uh, sometimes it's necessary to uh, uh, to violate secrecy that way. And in that case, it's not really a violation, right? You're doing the right thing. But there are some people who do not have the right to the truth. They don't have the right to every kind of truth they're asking for. So for the good and safety of others, uh, out of respect for privacy and the common good, um, one can be silent about what ought to be known, or one might make use of a discreet language. All right, so we understand what silence is. That's where I just don't talk about it. But I could also make use of a discreet language. Okay, so the Nazis come to the door and they're asking, uh, are there any Jews in the house? Well, if I just look at them, they're probably going to discover the, the people I'm harboring in my home, right? Well, if I'm not going to lie, just outright lie and say, nope, nope, nobody here, just, just me. If I'm not going to outright lie, I might make use of a discreet language. So that means I'm going to say something that uh, is likely to be misinterpreted by the hearer, but which is not, in fact, an untruth. So they come to the door. They say, are there any Jews in the house? I say, it would be awfully risky for me to keep Jews in the house. Well, what would they think? They think, oh, okay, this guy's, this guy's saying no, because the consequences for doing that would be very, would be very severe. And they might say, all right, all right, on your way, or we'll be on our way. But what have I said? I haven't actually said, nope, nobody here. I've just acknowledged to them, yeah, it would be really, really bad news for me if I were found harboring Jews in my home. So that's a kind of discreet language that could be used in place of a lie. This kind of sounds like I'm trying to give a, a lesson on how to use discrete language. But what I don't want to do that. What I want to do instead is talk about, because uh, I think this is an important uh, question that surely would be asked if we were in class together. So, so what, we, uh, what we're hearing called here, discrete language, uh, has been otherwise in the church's history termed a uh, wide mental reservation, a wide mental reservation. So uh, again, what I'm doing is I am uh, conveying something to the person who is asking me for information, which is not untrue itself, but is very likely to be misinterpreted by them. Uh, there are a couple of great examples that the saints give us, in fact. So one example uh, was uh, St. Francis of Assisi, once uh, was uh, was asked by a murderer whether his intended victim had come by. Now, St. Francis uh, evidently did something like this and said, oh no, he didn't pass this way, where he was kind of like pointing up one way of the road, indicating, nope, he didn't go that way, because in fact he had gone the other way, something like that. I think a, a much, uh, uh, I, I think a, an even better example of this uh, was, um, I think it was, uh, was it St. Athanasius? Maybe it was Clement of Alexandria. Uh, anyway, <laughs> one of the church fathers uh, in Egypt is uh, being pursued by, um, uh, by the, uh, you know, some, some cohort of uh, the, the Roman army because he's, uh, he's a Christian and this is during one of the, the great persecutions. So he's, he's rowing up the Nile and he's being pursued in his boat. And he tells his oarsman, like, get behind that clump of reeds and then turn back around. So the oarsman does as he's told. He gets around this clump of reeds and then he turns back around and they just go at a leisurely pace. Well, what happens? Uh, the, uh, the Romans, uh, as, they're, as they're coming head on to this boat, they say, did Athanasius go this way? And the oarsman says, 
Oh, if you keep going, you're going to catch him. Or no, that's not what he said. He says something like, oh, you're very close to him. So what do they do? They take their oars and they start rowing even harder. Okay, so what did he do there? He conveyed a piece of information, which was true. Right? They were, in fact, really, really close to Athanasius. Uh, but what he didn't say was that, yeah, I got him right here on my boat. That's not what they asked. So you can see how this wide mental reservation works. Um, now, this is, I think this is difficult to, uh, to, to really appropriate, right? It's really difficult to internalize this because I think we're so used to, maybe I'm just showing my, my personality a little bit too much, but I think we're so used to the easy uh, lie, the convenient lie, uh, the, the harmless little, little untruth, and the, um, like, certainly the necessary lie. Now, I should, uh, I should also mention that uh, St. Raymond of Penafort uh, said that, well, here's what a person should do if lives are on the line. They call this a necessary lie, right? When, uh, you know, say the murderers are at the door and they want to know if their intended victim is in the house. Well, it's a necessary lie, so you can do a couple of things. Well, you could be silent, but if your silence is going to give away the intended victim, then you could use this wide mental reservation. You could you could use discrete language to throw them off the victim's scent. Or he'd say, and this is this is a little in the weeds here. He says, you have this third option where if your conscience tells you that you should speak an untruth in order to save the life of this person, then you should do that. Um, but, uh, and he goes on to say that St. Augustine, who, uh, who is kind of the authority on, uh, uh, on this point, morally speaking, at, in the time of St. Raymond, he said St. Augustine wouldn't actually have a problem with any of these three options. So, hopefully you never have to find yourself in a situation where employing silence uh, mental reservation or a lie is a life and death situation, but there you go, because I think you were going to ask the question anyway. I, I know I, it was on my mind. Okay, so now that we've got that out of the way, let's talk about what offenses, apart from, uh, apart from this, uh, this narrow scope of lying um, and uh, what we've kind of just put our toes into about perjury, um, Let's go a little bit further. Let's see what other offenses are covered by this commandment. Because, of course, as we've seen with all the other commandments, it's not just this one specific mode of action that is going to be prohibited by the commandment. It's actually going to be, on the one hand, actually a kind of a wide uh, uh, field of acting that offends against this broader good. So what's the broader good being, being protected here? It's truth. It's truthfulness. Um, <clears throat> one of the reasons why uh, a lie is intrinsically evil or is by its nature to be condemned, as the Catechism puts it, is because it tears apart the fabric of social relationships. If I can't count on you to be true to your word, then we can't have contracts. We can't have agreements among ourselves, we're going to actually find it to be very difficult to, uh, to conduct a society on a broad or very narrow level. So a lie uh, makes it so that I always have to be suspicious of my neighbors, whereas truthfulness, um, probity, we might call it, uh, ensures that I'm as good as my word and my neighbor can uh, can rely on me to do what I have said. So let's talk about some other common offenses. So perjury, right? so we said false witness, that's where in court I am, uh, I'm testifying that this person did this thing or, or did not do this thing when the opposite is in fact true. It becomes perjury when I do that under oath. Now we often don't understand what it means to be under oath. Uh, to be under oath doesn't mean that I promise what I'm saying is true. To be under oath means that I've, I've made a statement as God is my witness. Like God witnesses to the truth of the statement I'm about to make. And that's why we saw uh, uh, previously in this course that um, 
uh, this was in the, the second commandment, right? Uh, that calling God to witness for falsehood was such a, a grave sin. So perjury is where I've actually called God to witness for a, a falsehood. Um, so rash judgment. This is something we're going to talk more about on Wednesday. So I'm not going to talk a whole lot about it right now. Feel free to read the pertinent paragraphs in the catechism if you have a burning curiosity. Um, detraction is a sin against the Eighth Commandment. Now, this is really interesting to me because unlike a lie, which is where I give false information with the hope of misleading somebody, detraction is an offense against the Eighth Commandment whereby I give truth to somebody, I make true statements that I ought not to make. I reveal truths about a person that I ought not to reveal. Um, so this is what the what the catechism says about it. Um, to uh, to commit detraction is it means without objectively valid reasons to disclose another's faults and failings to persons who did not know them and did not need to know them. That that last part I kind of added on. So obviously it's not detraction if I go to the police and uh, I say that uh, my neighbor is a murderer, right? They need to know that, and uh, it's for the good of, of society in general that they know that. But it's detraction if I, uh, if I go up to uh, my buddy and say, Hey, Tom, did you see how like, George was picking his nose over there? Ugh, right? Okay, so George is a nose picker. Tom doesn't need to know that. Um, it's detraction if I, uh, if I come to school and I talk poorly about my parents to other people like, oh my gosh, my dad did this horrible thing. My dad flew off the handle. My mom uh, was totally unreasonable. All right. That can be detraction, even if it's true. Actually, it's only detraction if it's true. Right. So when we share these things about our, about our friends, our enemies, our family members, complete strangers uh, that people don't need to know, that's detraction. Right? That's a sin because each person deserves to have a, they deserve the honor and good reputation of their name. And when we commit detraction, we make it so that uh, their name is, is unnecessarily harmed. That's detraction. Uh, Sirach is quoted or is, uh, is footnoted in the catechism on this point. Chapter 21, verse 28, a whisperer defiles his own soul and is hated in his neighborhood. Mm, think about that. All right, calumny. We're going to go through these kind of quickly. Calumny means uh, that by remarks contrary to the truth, I have harmed the reputation of another and given occasion for false judgments concerning them. So uh, that is fairly self-explanatory. But uh, in this case, um, you know, it might be where uh, for the sake of some advantage that I want to gain, uh, I'm going to spread mistruths, untruths about uh, another person. Think about like, you know, student body elections. Um, you know, I want to be the treasurer. And uh, in order to get that, I'm going to just go ahead and say that the other candidate for the treasurer uh, was found embezzling funds uh, last year, something like that, when it never really happened. That would be an example of calumny. Uh, complacence. Now, so these next three kind of go together. Uh, complacence, flattery, and adulation. So they're not actually um, the uh, necessarily the engaging in in uh, mis in untruth, um, but they go beyond. At least they go beyond what is good. So let's talk about these. So complacence is to speak pleasingly to another beyond what is true or good in order simply to please them. Uh, flattery is to speak pleasingly to another beyond what is true or good in order to gain some benefit from them. So you have something that I want, and I have a feeling that if I just butter you up, you're going to give me, uh, you know, some part of that. Uh, and adulation, adulation is, an, is a heightened form of flattery. This is, uh, this is just like falling down a disgusting praise of another person. Um, uh, for either you know something that they are or something that they're that they're doing or going to do, uh, so these three sins are um, are 
related to each other, um, especially in the aspect that committing these three sins towards someone who is doing something wrong, who is, who is engaging in some wrong act, is gravely immoral. So, for example, um, complacence. I have a friend who is contemplating, um, uh, let's, let's say, I'm, I have a friend who's contemplating theft, right? Because, you know, that store's prices are jacked way too high anyway, and the owner is really rich, and the thing that I want to take from them is, you know, why should, you know, I heard this a lot, actually, uh, during the whole, uh, you guys are too young to remember this, but Napster uh, was, uh, was a thing. And people were downloading music off of this without actually having to pay anybody for it, right? Intellectual property and all that stuff. So people would make the argument like, oh, well, those artists, they're so rich anyway. They don't need the money. Well, okay, if I were to come up to somebody knowing that what they were doing was wrong, and I said, yeah, you know, you've got the right way of thinking there. I think that you're doing, um, I, I think you would be in the right to take to take this stuff. That would be complacence, right? Speaking pleasingly to them beyond what is true or good, just in order to please them, right? I want them to be my friend. I want them to think highly of me. Well, flattery, um, by flattery, I would be trying maybe to, um, I, I don't know, gain, you know, maybe they're going to share stolen goods with me if I if I tell them how, how great and right they are for doing this. Um, and adu adulation, is going to be just flattery on steroids. Um, so they're, they're really in the same category. So anyway, uh, complacence, flattery, and adulation, when they are, um, when they're uh, committed towards somebody who is doing something objectively wrong is a grave evil. The Catechism also mentions that boasting and bragging are offenses against the Eighth Commandment. So um, boasting and bragging uh, mean that I'm inflating my own achievements or abilities for the sake of obtaining uh, favor or praise uh, from other people. Now, the question is going to come up, but what if it's true? What if I'm saying these things, like I'm, I'm, I really can, uh, I don't know, throw a football 100 yards, um, and I'm just letting people know that. Well, uh, how important... Is it that people know this about you? Um, how deserving uh, are you of the the praise for this amazing athletic feat? Um, it, if it's not a lie, it's certainly still a, an offense uh, against humility, right? And pride is the uh, is the root of all other sins. Uh, irony is sinful when it maliciously caricatures someone else's behaviors. Well, what do we mean by irony? Irony is speaking in a way that makes it clear that I actually mean the opposite of what I'm saying. So, for example, uh, when you all said uh, last night or earlier today, I just can't wait to get to Mr. Moe's theology lecture, that was irony and it was hurtful. Uh, or when uh, you said something like, I am so excited that school will continue during the pandemic, right? That was irony, and it was wrong, but I forgive you. I love you guys. Now, let's talk about um, the gravity of a lie. How do we know when a lie uh, is really harmful to us? Well, a, a couple of things. So first, what truth was deformed by this lie? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through a couple of examples for each of these criteria. So the truth deformed, the circumstances in which the lie was told, the intention of the speaker, and the harm endured by the victim. So let's go through each of those with a couple of examples. The truth deformed. Now, if my Aunt Tilly comes up to me and she's wearing this garish hat that she just bought, and she wants to know, do I think it looks nice? Maybe I don't, and I tell her that it looks really good on you. Yes, I like it. Or let's say, on the other hand, to take a, a different kind of a a, a different kind of a lie. Maybe I've been asked whether there are enough lifeboats on the Titanic, which I am responsible for. 
Hmm. All right, so we see there's two different things going on here, right? So, so what truth am I deforming? How grave is it? Well, that can be affected by the circumstances as well. So what are the circumstances of, of my potential untruth to Aunt Tilly? Well, is Aunt Tilly just going for a walk in the park and she wants to she wants my opinion about whether the hat she's planning to wear will be uh, a good complement to the rest of her outfit? Or is she about to go on national television and impart some really important message that people need to hear? Hmm, well, that's obviously a little bit different. Is she going to look totally ridiculous and her message is going to be lost? Well, now let's talk about the Titanic um, uh, example. Well, is the circumstance under which I, I tell this potential mistruth, untruth, that, well, the ship is really just going to be viewed in the shipyard. People are going to walk around on the decks, but it's just going to be there in the shipyard. It's not like it's going to sink or anything. Uh, so, uh, you know, not a big problem. Or is the situation that, well, this ship is going on a transatlantic voyage, and it could be really, really important that there would be enough lifeboats on it for everybody. So that's two different examples of the circumstances. So how about the intention of the speaker? Well, when I want to tell Aunt Tilly this untruth about her hat, let's say I don't think it's very attractive on her, um, but I want to please her, right? I just, I just want uh, to, you know, pay her a little compliment, even though it goes beyond what's true. So I, I tell her, hey, yeah, it looks good. So she goes for this walk in the park and, um, you know, well, well, we'll get to that. That's the, under the harm endured. So at any rate, I just want to please her by telling this untruth or knowing that she's about to go on live television. Do I have it in mind that she humiliate herself and that her, uh, her important message be completely lost and drowned out by how ridiculous she looks? Now let's go back to the shipyard for a second. Am I tempted to um, to tell this lie because I don't think very much of the risk, right? So remember, if the boat's just sitting there in the shipyard and people are going to walk around the deck, not a big deal if it sinks, right? Nobody's going to lose their life over this. Or knowing that it's going out uh, on an, on a voyage and I just underestimated how many lifeboats were going to be needed, do I want to cover my mistake? Or, a far more sinister thought, do I uh, know that there aren't enough life rafts or enough lifeboats and I want a calamity to take place and lives to be lost? So, three different intentions given there. So, how about the harm to be endured by the victim? So, on the one hand, if all my Tilly is doing is going for a walk in the park, um, Maybe the harm that she endures from my untruth is going to be she gets a couple of weird looks by complete strangers and, and uh, people she, she passes on the way. Or if she's on live television, uh, you know, uh, national television giving this important message, well, did I just kill her speech because she, like, nobody can hear her over her loud uh, outfit? So that would be two different uh, kinds of harm there. And we might say, well, who needed to hear this? Um, are they going to be harmed by the, the fact that her message is being undercut by the way she looks? Now let's talk about, I think, the sort of obvious ramifications of the, the lie of uh, Mr. Mo, the, the shipbuilder. Um, uh, well, if the boat stays in the shipyard, well, look at that. Probably no harm done, right? So there was a there was a very small risk that something might happen. I jeopardized uh, a few people um, on a very very to a very very slight degree, but nothing bad happened. So, whew. or obviously on this transatlantic voyage, uh, did did many many people die because of the untruth that I told? Yeah. So those are the the ways we want to assess the gravity of a lie. What is the truth deformed? What are the circumstances of this lie? Um, what is my intention as the lie teller? 
and what is the harm or potential harm to be endured uh, by the victims. Now, I want to close with this thought, this thought about reparation. Um, so because every lie that we tell is an offense against charity and justice, there exists a duty for me as the lie teller to make some kind of reparation for the lie told. Um, so whenever possible, I have to correct the falsehood that I have propagated. And sometimes that doesn't just mean uh, that I have to do the humiliating task of going to somebody and saying, hey, look, I lied. Uh, you know, George wasn't actually picking his nose or George doesn't didn't actually embezzle a bunch of money from the school last year. Um, I was saying that because I wanted to get ahead, right? So um, it might be more than that, because let's say I won the election based on that lie that I told. Well, now I actually, in justice, I should step down from that position and it should be given to my opponent, unless there is some other disqualifier, um, disqualifying reason why George should not be the treasurer. On the other hand, think also about what would happen if I got on uh, if I got on Facebook and uh, sent out this uh, this status. Um, you know, Burger Hut uses rat meat in all their burgers, and because of that, they lose a ton of business. Well, now my obligation to make a reparation is even greater. Right? This is assuming Burger Hut doesn't actually use rat meat in their burgers. Well, now I've done two things. I've I've lied to the public, so I've got to correct that. I've got to I've got to put a statement out that says, "Hey, God, I made that up. That's not true." And also, what about all the lost revenue? What about the employees of this business who maybe you know, God forbid, had to be laid off because they had lost so much business, right? Well, now I'm obligated to make some kind of material reparation in so far as it's possible for me to do that. Uh, so we want to be really careful about telling lies. Not only is it very difficult to get out of a lie, uh, because typically we have to tell more lies to protect the initial lie, but it, additionally, uh, this duty of reparation can be really, really difficult to, uh, to it, it's a heavy burden to bear, and it may exceed our ability to do so. And what is it? What happens in that case? Well, we become just sort of socially bankrupt, right? We have no credit among anybody anymore, uh, and that's a bad way to be. All right. Well, that concludes our uh, our intro to the eighth commandment: um, "Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor." Um, I would ask you, please, to have uh, read. Uh, this uh, section of the catechism um, for uh, Wednesday. And just so we're clear, that section of the catechism is going to be 2464 to 2503. On Wednesday, we're going to be talking about rash judgment. So you might want to pay special attention to that section. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Be well, stay healthy. You're all in my prayers. Bye-bye.